Welcome back to the Tapes Archive podcast, where we release interviews that have never been heard before. In this episode, we have Metallica's co-founder and drummer, Lars Ulrich. At the time of this interview in 1997, Ulrich was 34 years old and was promoting the band's concert date in Indianapolis. In the interview, Lars talks about Metallica's songwriting process, the weirdest encounter he has ever had with a fan, what motivates him, and how the internet can be a frightening instrument. We got a ride from a real fan. I used to sleep with Lars's grandmother. Never listen to our music again. As always, we have music critic Mark Allen at the helm conducting the interview. If you'd like to support the show, please like, follow, and subscribe to us on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram. There, we post other content and information not available on the podcast. If you'd like to read the transcripts for any of our episodes, please head over to our website at thetapesarchive.com. We'll jump into the interview after a quick word from our sponsors. The Tapes Archive is proud to be sponsored by the true crime documentary, Dead Man's Line. You've got a hundred armed officers around here trying to get a shot at me. I dared them to shoot me. I didn't go down there to be a buffoon. I went down there for vengeance. And by God, I'll have vengeance. In 1977, Tony Karitsis kidnapped a mortgage broker and held him captive for three days. For the first time ever, the media was able to cover the event live. To some, Tony was a hero. To others, he was a crazed thug. Dead Man's Line, the true story of Tony Karitsis. This award-winning film is available exclusively on Amazon Prime. One last thing before we get to the interview, the Tapes Archive podcast is a proud member of Osiris Media, a global community connecting passionate fans with podcasts and experiences about artists and topics you love. Thanks for tuning in, and now it's time to open the vault. So how are you? Where are you? Okay, I'm in Chicago. Uh, so is it true that uh, that your, your wedding song was uh, Pat Boone's version of Fender Sandman? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Thank you for laughing. <laughs> yeah, of course it was. Of course it is. Yeah. Uh, I, you know what? Honestly, I don't remember. It was four in the morning. And, uh, I just remember when I saw the video back of the wedding that I was. My mom yelled at me for having my hands in my pocket when I got married. <laughs> but uh, yeah. other than that, it was. I'm glad we did it that way. Yeah, well, congratulations. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. And uh, and and how about this Pat Boone version of this? Have you heard this? You know what? I, I've got to tell you, I'm going against. I, I can already tell from talking to a few radio stations and stuff like that. There seems to be some kind of a hostility building up towards this. But I mean, I don't know what people are scared of. I mean, this guy is like so unthreatening. I mean, do you know what I mean? I think he's great. I met him at the AMAs the other day. He was really nice. He was really funny. He was really friendly. And I think he's done one of the more interesting versions of one of our songs that I've ever heard because most versions that end up of our songs end up being something that's very unimaginative and and very close to the bone. And at least this is very different. I think it's really cool. Okay, I, I thought he totally missed the point, but uh, it's to me it sounds like a cheerful song the way he does it. Yeah, but you know what? I think that you gotta give, I mean, anytime anybody takes any type of creative piece of work or whatever it is, and at least alters it and puts in their own flavor and their own interpretation of it, then whether I mean, when, when you miss the point or not, I mean, that's almost irrelevant to me because, I mean, who, who's, to, who's to say what the point is anyway out of any of this stuff, do you know what I mean? But at least if you if you add your own flavor to anything, then that's I think that has value. And I think that he did that. And there's very few of the people who have interpreted our music who have done that. And I think that's always what's missing. I definitely expect that a lot. Yeah. A couple of songs I wanted to ask you about from the new album. Um, my, my two favorites are uh, Hero of the Day and Mama Said. I think they have the, the tension and fear that I always like about Metallica music. Can you tell me uh, anything in particular about those songs? Yeah, it's interesting you pick those two songs because they're probably the ones that most of our fans, and who's to even say what that word means anymore, but um, most of our fans are probably would say that those are definitely the two oddballs. Hero of the Day is probably the first song that we've ever done in a major key that has some the major musical 
uh, passages through the verses, and uh, a lot of people are saying that it has sort of almost an REM tendencies to it or, or something like that. It was something that came from Kirk and was an idea that was one of his tapes, and then me and James interpreted and turned it into a song. Our mama said was something that was on one of James's tapes that initially on the first batch of tapes that he gave me, it wasn't on there. And then he gave me a tape later on into the songwriting process, and that was on there. And I said that I really liked it, you know, the kind of skeleton of the song. And he said that he was kind of worried or whatever because he didn't really know if it was Metallica enough or not. And I said, you know, what are you, what are you worried about? If it's, if it's on a Metallica record, it means me and you write it and the four of us play on it, then I think it qualifies as a Metallica song. It's obviously also one of those things that are fairly different. You know, a lot of people have been saying this whole thing about the country influence and stuff like that, which was never apparent to me until the first journalist heard it and started commenting on that. I thought it was just another song. Now I can obviously hear how people can interpret it that way. But uh, you're right. I mean, those songs are very moody and certainly have some, uh, some nice tensions in them and stuff, and that's pretty cool, I guess. Yeah, the... the um the, the line in, in Mama said about the brightest flame burns the burns out quickest. I guess that's not always true because look at Metallica, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, Mama wasn't always right. I guess. Well, <laughs> Mama doesn't get paid to always be right. <laughs> She's got a pretty high batting average. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is that pretty typically how you write? They give you instrumental stuff and you you put the words to it. Um. No, we work. No, we work a lot with tapes. Is what we do, and um, so me and James sort of end up being the receiving end of like all these tapes from everybody. And uh, I'll sit down and go through James' tapes, and then me and James sit down and go through the other guys' tapes, and we pick out the best parts. We work very much with parts, and then sort of parts end up being turned into songs, and then songs end up getting words to them. And it's it, it's a pretty unusual process, even just because the fact that obviously the quote-unquote drummers is, is pretty involved in it. We have a tendency to develop songs from sort of ideas that just kind of surface. There's really not anything that's ever written as a song that just stays as a song. It's like, here's a part that gets married to another part that gets married to this guy's part, and then we throw in this chord progression, and then we go to a half-tempo thing here, and do you know what I mean? And then you kind of sit down and put some words to it. And James does most of that. And it's, it's kind of a pretty unusual process. So it's possible that, that two, three, four songs from these tapes might end up as one song on an album. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially if you go back to our early stuff, you can hear how a lot of that stuff is really sort of pieces of songs that are sort of forced together, which is, I think, what we pretty much started getting away from after Unjustice. All. Yeah, that that would make sense. But it, it, now, as a listener, because that's that is what it sounds like. But right. uh, but I never, th you know, you just never would think that that happened that way. That things were put together, pieced together that way. So that's well, yeah, that, that's amazing. It's a very uh, forced thing, and now it's a lot less forced. Now we try and keep the songs a lot more simplistic. Here, our uh, local alternative radio station this weekend is doing a mandatory Metallica weekend. Oh my God, hell! And and I'm thinking you must, you guys must be laughing at this stuff. I I'm mean, pretty it, much always laughing. Well, yeah, I, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you are one of the lighter spirits in rock right. and roll. I <laughs> do appreciate that. Well. But, but, I mean, this has just got to be so funny to you to, to just see the, this embrace, this whole nonsense, this whole discussion of is Metallica alternative? What is this? Yeah, I think it just goes to prove, I mean, if anything, that, that the things we've always talked about were so insignificant, really continue to be insignificant, which are the things about dividing music into groups and forcing tags and names and separations between different music forms and I, uh, I think it's something that a lot of people feel that they need but I think that as time has been going on in the last few years a lot of people are realizing that it's maybe not as necessary as it used to be and that these divisions between not only the bands and the music but also the people who enjoy the bands and the music maybe are starting to erode somewhat compared to where it was 10 years ago or 20 years ago. And I think that's a 
pretty good thing, a very healthy thing. Now, of course, it's funny in some way, and of course, you could also sit down and say, of course, Metallica should be played on alternative radio stations because in some way we were, 10 years ago, we were one of the first alternative bands. So, I mean, you can almost slice and dice it any way you want to, and then you can almost sit down and say that it's funny because why would we play it on an alternative station? But 10 years ago, if you know what I mean, it's, it's sort of like almost no matter what point of view you come in with, it either holds up or it doesn't, and it's almost sort of irrelevant at the end. It's just how people interpret what you do, and I'm certainly never going to tell anybody how to interpret anything I do, and I really just to, you know, let people deal with that however they want to. Well, I agree with you on this point. It's it's irrelevant because good music is good music, and sh it should be played no matter what. I mean, no matter what you call it, everybody should hear it. Yeah. And uh, maybe that's what, if Lollapalooza proved anything last summer, maybe that's what it proved, right? That, that I hope so. I mean, it sounds kind of corny, and it sounds a little simple when you say, you know, there's only two kinds of music, really. There's good music and less good music. That's almost how I feel. It, it's a little bit of a, of a sort of cornball approach or, or sort of reads corny. But it's, you know, I mean, I think musicians are the ones that are sometimes, most of the time, fighting the categorization more so than anybody. And between the critics and between the fans that they kind of seem to try and, and divide everything else into categories and stuff like that which is fine but it doesn't mean that i have to endorse it for critics it's i guess it's somewhat of a necessary evil because you have to try to describe what you've heard sure, of course but the idea that because it's a certain kind of music should somebody yeah. shouldn't listen to it that's well, i think the joke. beautiful thing about where we are right now is that as music gets more and more intertwined and more and more multicolored and multi-dimensional that it becomes less and less easy to segregate from the next thing and I think that's a great thing because you have these people sit there, you know, you listen to a band like Black Grape or, or whatever, and you say, you know, what is that? And you sit down and 10 minutes later, you still have no idea what the hell, you know, is it rap, <laughs> is it funk, is it dance, is it rock? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And that's just a great thing. Well, so one other question about this, and that is, where did this idea come from that you guys were going alternative? I mean, who said that? Because it's because uh, it's obviously not true. I mean, Load is is a pretty typical Metallica album. I'd say. Um, I think that you have to look to the internet for some of this stuff. I think that for as much good as out of the fact that people can tap into this type of information and sort of chat to each other in this way that you can in the '90s, there's also certainly some kind of negative connotations to it, which is that. Basically, any idiot with a computer can post something on the internet, and within 15 minutes later, it's a half-truth that's circulated around the world. It's a pretty frightening instrument, actually. I mean, people already judging our record. You know, I was sitting sort of, while we were finishing the record in the studio, reading sort of almost reviews of the record on a daily basis before it was even done, while I was still finishing the record, you know what I mean? And it's just, it's a very strange beast to deal with and I think that this whole thing about you know where did it come from you know some idiot somewhere associated the fact that James Hetfield cut his hair with something about fitting into the 90s or something like that and then the next guy picked it up as being alternative and off there goes the brush fires you know what I mean I don't know where else it comes from so you've tr that's about as close as you can trace it huh that's just the internet yeah, man. I mean I think you have to generally look to the internet as that it's almost like I think that the less hard information they have to work with the more silly the rumors get you know what I mean the more information there is the less it gets sort of bent out of shape but on some of these things that when you're tight lipped about it then the more ridiculous they end up becoming and it's kind of an interesting pattern that goes there. So is it possible for, I mean, the people who are commenting on the record while you're still making it, do they actually know anything about the record, or are they just making stuff no, up? they're making stuff oh, up. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. All right. Uh, you know, the other place that, that I heard a lot, <laughs> a lot of this record was Pharrell on the Bench, the sure. sports show. And uh, uh, Are you guys friends with him and stuff? Uh I, I think it would depend how you interpret the word friend. Certainly know him fairly well and had some fun times with him. I certainly do speak with him and definitely think he's a pretty funny guy. And, and 
when he was up in the Bay Area, we used to uh, we used to go to a lot of hockey games, and then we'd call him and give like reports uh, to Pharrell uh, on the hockey games on the way back from the game and stuff like that. Definitely is the history there. Yeah, it's it's pretty classic to hear this stuff uh, underneath a sports report, though. I like that a lot. I think that's pretty cool. Yeah. 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 I mean, he was a guy, you know, he, is, he goes back to Atlanta about four or five years ago, and when he started in Atlanta, he was definitely doing something that was very extreme and very cool and I think he hasn't lost too much of it it's kind of an open ended question here what motivates you I mean you guys do tons of press you do a lot of things that you don't have to do and uh, why I mean I'm glad you do but <laughs> um, it's but... probably because we don't know any different it's how we've always operated we basically came up the classic European way I think which is the fact that you go out and you don't get any airplay, you don't depend on the medium of radio to get what you do across. Then you go out and basically force what you do down people's throats. You go out and play as many gigs as you can. You do as many interviews as you can with print medium and try and jump on any opportunity to force what you do down people's throats. That's what we did in the 80s. And when radio finally embraced us in the 90s, for some reason, we didn't stop forcing ourselves down people's throat because it's just how we're used to dealing with things. And uh, I guess it's just kind of stuck. I think we're certainly less manic about it than we used to be. But, I mean, when you ask me that point blank, it, it's probably because it really is the way we know and it's the way we've always done things. From what I understand, uh, I was talking to a Corrosion of Conformity's publicist, and they said that like all your good habits are rubbing off on them because they're seeing... <laughs> <laughs> because they're seeing how yeah, how well, you should bad do. Yeah, bad are rubbing off. Of <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean they're seeing what you should do. I mean right. how you should handle people, how you should deal with the press, and that kind of thing. And uh, you know, there's so many people who just think you know that they're they're too good to talk to anybody. That uh, you know, when a band like Metallica comes along, I mean it's it, it's one of the few bands that you can actually count on to do yeah, the right thing. We've always so. kind of enjoyed. I mean, I wouldn't say enjoyed, but it's some that we probably all always has been a part of what we've done. The show that you're doing just sounds pretty, just unbelievable every night. Are you are you having like the, I mean, do you have one stage that you're carrying or you're leapfrogging city no, to don't. city? It goes up and down every night thanks to about a good hundred people Jeez. that work for us. And um, it's pretty amazing. It's something I try not to think about because it's, it's that potential for something going wrong in terms of you know, somebody has a flat tire, the occasional snowstorm or something could really fuck the whole thing up pretty good. But, I mean, without sucking anybody off, we really had some of the best people working on those sides of it. And the show goes up and down five times a week, and it's pretty amazing in itself that that even happens. Yeah, that that's, <laughs> that is pretty stunning. Um, uh, just a couple of things, if I can. Um, the, the cover of the new album is, is a Serrano piece, and did you pick Serrano deliberately, or, or did you just have no, to like this? No, we like the image a lot. There was no hidden attempt to, you know, start a revolution or, you know, to uh, turn anything upside down. Or it was. I think we were going for something that was, uh, we've always had everything, you know, the album title, the song titles, the covers, everything sort of tie in together. And I, we, I think we were feeling that we wanted to go more neutral to have each thing be more their own entities. And uh, so we wanted like an album time that didn't really mean much and a sort of visual that really didn't have much to do with song seven on the record or something. So we started getting individual in, in, as entities and really liked the, the image of, of Serrano and you know, that vision when some of the he's done and kind of what he said. Yeah, you're you're uh, you're fading on me a little bit. But. Okay, yeah, I'm just a serious amount of concrete here. Still <laughs> okay. with me? Yeah, I'm still okay. I'm still there. So uh, so there's no uh, image of uh, if I if I look real closely, there's no image of uh, Jesus and uh, urine in this picture. I, I, I mean, if you had nothing but time on your hands, I would suggest certainly keep looking. Uh -huh. Give me an update when I see you uh, next week. But uh, I wouldn't waste my time if you have. Other things to do. Yeah. Okay. I think. <laughs> uh, uh, or, you know, call and ask her, what's this fox? <laughs> what is his name? Um, 
Maybe he can help you. Yeah. Well, okay. Uh, a, a couple of real quick things. Um, the God That Failed, my favorite Metallica song. You playing The God That Failed? Are you playing that song this time? Not this time, no. Um, I played it uh, you played before. It, yeah, yeah. I saw you play it once, but, you know, you always hope that you'll play it again. So. And uh, for another story I've been working on, I'm asking everybody I interview, what's the strangest, funniest, weirdest encounter you've ever had with one of your fans? I'm, uh, I'm, I'm losing you here. Mark? Yeah, I, I haven't heard anything you said yet. Okay, no, I didn't say anything. Okay. Um, well, we have a... a uh, no, it's cold. Wait a second, I'm losing you again. Uh, are you still there? A um, magazine called So What that we run out of our fan club. Uh -huh. And one of the contests I had to judge was write anything that's Metallica related on a piece of paper. And, uh, you know, any, like any kind of short, you know, any, anything you want on any topic. And some guy wrote a, a story about how he spent 10 years of his life basically wishing he was me and dreaming about being me and every night and basically making himself look like me and acting like me and talking like me and every night going to bed wishing he could someday meet me. And I picked him to be the winner of the contest and the... the contest a prize was a visit to San Francisco to hang out with us so he came out and hung out and there was like face to face with my the other me in, from Duluth Minnesota and uh, that was pretty surreal that's frightening yeah yeah, yeah. did you and how did he react when he I mean did he... Uh, he was actually he was pretty cool we've actually almost become friends okay. at least in the same the same way that me and Pharrell had <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> So, uh, you know, it, it's pretty cool. Yeah, and, and finally, I just want to ask you, you always seem really happy, like you're really enjoying yourself. And uh, am I right about that? And, and how come other people can't be like that? I don't take it too seriously because I do, obviously, there are certain things about this that I do take fairly seriously. I just think that you've got to have the ability to mock yourself and laugh at yourself about this. And half of the laughing that I do is always at myself or at people I'm with. And I think that's the one thing that separates us and gives us longer legs than most other people is that we always take the piss out of ourselves. It's, a, it's an ability that a lot of people lack. Uh, that'll work. Uh, anything else you want me to tell people? No, well, look forward to coming back and having some of that horseradish down at the old St. Elmo's joint there. You know it well. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. Listen, I really appreciate you doing this because obviously you don't have to. I mean, you sure, guys yeah, are sold out. Well. And, uh, and, and uh, we we'll look forward to coming back. That we played when well, we played in uh, out at the old uh, what you call it there? Um, oh, Deer Creek. Yeah, Deer yeah. Creek. Uh, it was probably one of I'd say two or three best lot of losers last summer, and. Um, so we got that to look forward to and trying to top when we come back next week. Good. Okay. Well, I'm looking forward to it. Okay, thanks man. a lot. All right, Mark. I'll see you soon, okay? Hey, thanks for listening to the Tapes Archive podcast. Please remember you can always find more information about the show and the individual episodes at our website, thetapesarchive.com. Until next time, the vault is closed.